So I just picked a random song called Money. <laughs> it was probably an appropriate one to open this session with. Uh, so yeah, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. Uh, super excited for this session. Uh, today we have uh, Robert Breedlove joining us. Uh, the session is called Money, Bitcoin, and Freedom Maximalism. And uh, we're going to introduce Robert in a moment. Uh, but uh, first, uh, Katie Kelly, uh, our friend Katie Kelly from the Serious Playground, uh, will be interviewing uh, Robert today and introducing him. And uh, Katie uh, is in and out of different uh, freedom and crypto-oriented communities. And one of her favorite books is The Sovereign Individual, uh, which is uh, one of Robert's favorite books, hence why I asked Katie to uh, interview Robert today. And how today is going to work, Katie and Robert are going to have an exchange for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to pivot to Q&A. So if you have any questions for Robert anytime, pop them in the chat, and I'll call on you, and you can ask your question to Robert. If you don't want to be on YouTube, just uh, indicate in that chat, uh, and I'll read your question on your behalf. So that being said, uh, Katie, tag you're it, uh, and uh, thank you for hosting. Hey, thank you for having me, Peter, and thanks for being here, Robert. So yeah, like Peter said, I'm Katie, super excited to be here and introduce Robert Breedlove. He describes himself as a freedom maximalist and philosopher in the Bitcoin space. He's host of the What is Money show. And something interesting about him is first and foremost for him, he's written that he sees Bitcoin as a humanitarian movement. So in order to understand that, I think it's important for us to first understand what is money. And Robert has a really interesting take on that. He wrote a series of pieces on money as an attention allocation technology, kind of for that distributed cognition system of the free market. So first off, I was hoping that Robert, you could set the stage on what is money and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, Katie, thanks for having me. Um, real quick on the theme music. I thought that was your guys like actual theme music. And I was gonna have to suggest um, it does not accord well with, with Bitcoin. There's way too many mentions of dollars and bank accounts and those things. So. Um, but now that no, makes it sense. Is. It was just a random spin. Okay. Um, you know, what's funny. Uh, the, the show obviously is called the what is money show. I found that question to be quite fascinating. It's kind of a, it's either one metaphor might be that the rabbit that leads you down the rabbit hole. I think when you start asking the question, what is money? You find your way into the Bitcoin rabbit hole, which is this sort of seemingly infinitely branching philosophical domain where you know once you get into bitcoin and realize that most things in the world are a scam or a lie it kind of shatters your worldview in, in many ways and it forces you to reestablish new philosophical anchor points with reality you know it's almost like becoming a three-year-old again you're like why 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 and um it's a hard question to answer actually i've written uh, a lot about it. I've provided a few different answers that, you know, I've either read in books. I've I've actually received several unique ones from my guests I've had on the show. Uh, some that I've formulated myself, as you mentioned, the attention allocation technology, which is one I think I came up with myself, but obviously influenced by a lot of great thinkers. Um, so when someone asks me that question, which is very common for the guy that hosts the What Is Money show, and they say, hey, you know, what's money? I have this roster of like 50 plus answers that I can pull from. And so I never know exactly where to begin. But mm. um, one, I'll just use one that I, I had a conversation yesterday. Uh, if you guys watched the show, I had Jason Lowry on again. Jason Lowry is a, uh, he's like a junior cadet at the US Space Force. I might not be seeing his exact title correctly. But he's become very interested in Bitcoin and how it fits into his thesis of power projection as the primary mode of really biological organization, but also a human socioeconomic organization that it's very dependent on the economics of how we project power. And you also mentioned the book, The Sovereign Individual, that I think also goes into that a great deal. Um, anyone that's read the book and is a fan of it, I would say to dive in to the bibliography as well. There's a lot of literature on the economics of force or violence that is just not explored really at all in mainstream curriculum. It's not really even explored that much in non-mainstream curricula like Austrian economics. They don't talk a lot about it, but I think it's a very fundamental aspect of, of reality, right? It's how, it's where social systems meet physical reality, I guess you might say. So long-winded um, segue to try and answer your question. One of the answers to what is money 
is that money is a proxy for power. Um, now, I want to be very clear on my definition of power. The word, I think in most people's interpretation today, when you say the word power, it means authority, right? It means arbitrary, typically political power, I think is what m most people refer to. Um, if you're a subordinate in an organization, you might say your boss has the power. If you're a citizen in the United States, you might say the president has all the power or the legislative branch, something like that. But um, there is, you know, I would argue that the political dimension of power is just one half of the story. Um, there is another half, which is more fundamental, or at least as fundamental, in my opinion, and that is physical power. And in physics, there's an equation for this, right? This is a very objective term. Um, it is a, I think it is a scalar, not a vector, meaning that it doesn't have direction, but it does have a magnitude. But it's essentially the, the channeling of energy over time. So how we move energy over time is power. The capacity to move energy over time is power. Now, in an economy, the sole aim really is to maximize physical power, the ability of humans to create physical movement in the real world, right? That's what technologies do for us. You know, machines give us mechanical advantage and leverage. Obviously, uh, digital technologies enable us to communicate much more seamlessly across time and space, which means we can get more done, which means we're more productive, which is the same thing as saying that the number of humans on earth are capable of generating more physical power per, per capita, if you will. That is what an economy is aimed at doing, is producing more physical power. And this gets into, if you take that all the way out and extrapolate, there's the I think it's called the Kardashev scale. People may have heard of this, where a civilization could almost be defined as how much energy it can harness. There's, um, and there's different steps in the, in the scale. There's like Kardashev scale one, two, three. Uh, I don't know the exact terms, but like maybe scale one is you've harnessed all the energy on your planet. Scale two would be you've harnessed all the energy on your star, you know, and it, it goes out from there. And that is at least... I don't want to say it's equivalent, but it's at least a proxy for how much wealth you've created in the world. It's a proxy for productivity uh, or capital accumulation. And so there's this very real necessity uh, in an economy to harness more physical power. But to do that, we have to engage with one another um, through these imaginary constructions, right? Like businesses and nation states and everything, right? Even social circles, you know, anywhere you have a role uh, or anywhere you have influence over others is a, a domain where the political power comes to pass, where there's a, you know, if you're a, a figurehead of a company, right? There's a symbolic power you have in that organization such that what you say causes people to move disproportionately to, if you're just a guy at a music festival shouting at people, right? You don't have so much political power in that domain, let's say. Um, I'm coming up with these examples on the fly. I hope they make sense. If they don't, let me know. Totally, they do. <laughs> um, so we're, we're constructing these hierarchies, which are a technology in and of themselves, right? The way we organize ourselves towards the aim of higher productivity is very intrinsic to the market process. We, this is the division of labor, right? We can accomplish greater results working in concert than we can working in isolation. It's simple, physical fact forces us to construct human hierarchies. And inside of human hierarchies, we're basically playing imagination with one another, right? My power as a CEO is premised on your belief in my power as a CEO. Like as soon as you say, F, you know, fuck this, I quit, that, that's gone. That whole relationship is broke, breaks down. So we have to use these imaginary structures which involve political power to harness physical power to accomplish the aim of, of increasing productivity and wealth creation in the world. So money is like, it's an interesting one, right? Because it is a symbolic, stru symbolic structure in and of itself. But if you look at the origins of money, it's also rooted in physical power. Like the, the creation of gold, for instance, was based on a proof of work that, and this is one of the properties like it contributed to the scarcity of gold that made it become money on the free market. It was rooted in the physics of reality that constrained its supply from arbitrary debasement or counterfeiting 
that made it useful as money. So we assigned or imputed the symbolic value of money to gold because of its rootedness and physical power. So then it becomes an instrument of tremendous political power in the process. And again, we're in this, you know, oftentimes when I ask this question about money, I find myself um, getting into how it bridges different worlds. It bridges mm -hmm. domains, right? You know, subjective, objective, consumer, producer. It, it's always the, the intermediating third in, in, in many of these instances. And I think uh, on this notion of power, it's similar, right? It kind of mediates between political and physical power. Um, it's not that holding a lot of gold, you know, makes you stronger or anything like that. You can't actually move faster, better, cheaper in the world, but due to the symbolic relevance we've assigned it in the marketplace, it gives you tremendous political power. And that makes it's, but it's political power, again, rooted in the physical power necessary to produce it. So it's just a very uh, interesting relationship. And that's why one of the answers I would give is money is a proxy for power in both senses. That's a really cool framing to work with. I think money being a proxy for power and kind of intermediating between the physical power and the political. Um, you mentioned earlier that you saw our current financial system as kind of a scam. So it seems like if money is this tech that we use that like allows us to to work with power um, and gives us symbols that we can wield to understand it in more abstract ways and like interact with one another. Um, how is our current system of money um, moving certain types of political power in scammy or unjust ways? And you're obviously a Bitcoiner. Um, so how do you see Bitcoin as um, like in this framing of money as power? How do you see Bitcoin as, uh, as changing the way that power moves? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the first thing to understand is that since officially since 1971, and I would argue um, to some degree prior to that, and in many instances prior to that, especially in wartime, we have been off of a gold standard. Like every time countries would go to war, they would typically abandon the gold standard so they could print a lot of money and pay soldiers. Um, but the effect of this, when you go off of a gold standard, is the currency issuing authority, which is the central bank or the nation state, they're typically pretty closely aligned. They're able to steal wealth. They're able to steal um, the savings of the society using the currency through fiat currency inflation. This is why I often say that inflation is theft. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward. If, if money is a representation of goods and services, if you can, pr if one group can print money, and another group cannot, then the group that can and the can steal from the group that cannot. And so long as the group that cannot acquiesces to this, typically unknowingly, right? People just don't understand money. Um, that 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 parasitic relationship can be upheld. Could you explain so, just real quickly, like in a in a concrete, like bombastic example, maybe like how inflation steals from the public? Yeah. Like so. Let me try to give the most rudimentary example I could possibly think of. There are just a hypothetical. There are 100 Babe Ruth rookie baseball cards in the world. I'm not saying this is true. This is just a hypothetical example. There are 100 certified Babe Ruth rookie baseball cards in the world. If all of a sudden one individual develops a way to counterfeit those Babe Ruth rookie baseball cards, right? And he can create number 101, 102, 103 for himself or herself. Then they are able to effectively steal or dilute the market value of the existing 100. So if each of the 100 was worth $1,000 each, and there's a $100,000 market cap of Babe Ruth rookie baseball cards in the world, but one guy starts printing them, every new baseball card that enters circulation dilutes that total market cap, right? So you take that 100 thousand dollar market cap divided by 100 then you divide it by 101 102 103 104 105 and by the time you get to 200 you've diluted everyone all the existing holders by 50 percent right by the time you get to 400 you've diluted them um 75 percent so i think that math is right but hopefully that like that is the most simplistic example i can give for inflation is that there is a demand for purchasing power, which there is a demand for the potential goods and services that money represents. There's never a demand for a definite quantity of money. You actually don't care how many dollars in your bank account. It depends how much bang each buck has. 
That's what you ultimately care about. So the issuing authority is effectively taking the spot of that baseball card counterfeiter. And indeed, as I've said this a lot, inflation is legal counterfeiting. Counterfeiting is criminal inflation. There is zero mechanical difference. There is only a jurisdictional difference, a legal, a legalistic difference. So what we have in the central bank is a globally concerted somewhat, uh, it's coming apart today, but it's a global currency counterfeiting operation. Um, now we've been sold the lie, you know, that inflation is necessary for, for a healthy economy, but it's just simply not the case. There's inflation cannot do anything. It cannot create any new wealth. It can only reallocate goods and services from the hands of one group to the hands of another group. It can't, you can't print dollars and feed people. You can't print dollars and create machinery. You can't print dollars and uh, put boats in the ocean, right? It, it's not, that doesn't make sense. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that was uh, great. That was great. Um, so if you're printing dollars and reallocating money and power from one group to another. Yes. So, that... and again, this is the importance of gold is that because gold required energy to go and mine, for, to discover it, to mine it, to extract it, to refine it, to coin it, right? To convert it into money. This was the proof of work necessary to produce gold. So that physical power constraint is what prevented gold from being counterfeited. Now, as I said, we've gone off of the gold standard many times across history, but officially and globally in 1971, so 50 to 51 years ago, we went off of it entirely. Um, I always point people at this point in the conversation to the website, WTF happened in 1971.com. Uh, the consequences of severing the dollars pegged to gold have been catastrophic. It's not just financial. It's not just debt that's exploded. It's obesity rates. It's drug abuse. It's uh, the dissipation of the nuclear family. It's suicide. Like it, it go, the list goes on and on and on. So this is where you know, we get into the corruption of money leading to the corruption of humanity, in my opinion. Maybe it's too strong of an assertion, but I think there's a lot of data there. Um, and there's a lot of logically deduced arguments we've made as to why that happens as well. So what we could say through the lens of power is that in 1971, we severed our tie to physical reality in the monetary system, right? We severed our tie to physical power this restraint, this proof of work constraint, let's say, that um, gold mining placed on the counterfeiting of currency so that it could not be done too much, right? You couldn't debase the currency too rapidly because if you did, people would call your bluff. They would take the dollars to the bank and redeem them for gold. And if the bank runs out of gold, well, the bank goes belly up. So if you suspend convertibility or even better, you just end it entirely as we did with fiat currency. We just said this will never be redeemable for gold again, um, which is a really important point, by the way. The paper dollar and paper currencies themselves are just promissory notes to real money. They're not actually money. They're currency. They're an application of money. So when you, when I say promissory note, that means it's a promise that I can take the dollar to the bank and they promise they'll give me gold. When we break that connection, we have basically permanently broken the promise embedded in that promissory note. So when I say it's a living lie, like it's, it's total bullshit. It's here's a dollar. I promise you I'll swap it for gold anytime you want. And then in 1971, Nixon says, you know what? We're, we're not going to keep that promise anymore. So it's just a complete, um, it's a, frankly, just kind of a bullshit monetary substitute. Uh, it's a debt-based monetary substitute. I've called it an uncollateralized government debt certificate undergoing slow motion default while its use is forced on society at the tip of a gun. And I think that's approximately accurate. Um, and so when we divorce money from the constraints physical power places upon it, we devolve into a very politicized money, uh, money that can be counterfeited or printed ad infinitum effectively until the point of hyperinflation. And this leads to the overgrowth of the government, the fiat state, the large centralized government that we all suffer under today is a direct consequence of the breaking of uh, the link to gold, right? It, you could think of gold, and if you get into the history of it, 
it's long been kind of a check on government oppression where again if your government's being too irresponsible printing money you could either redeem your gold and leave the country go to a more responsible jurisdiction or you could just take demand in specie which is in physical gold you could store it in your home and you could you could cast a vote of no confidence in this currency counterfeiting regime with fiat currency you simply cannot do that there's no place there prior to bitcoin there's no mm. place to go you can go into physical gold, although it was outlawed in 1933, the United States Executive Order 6102. It's been outlawed many times throughout history. It's often called unpatriotic in war times because the country wants you to you know, buy the bonds and use their shitty printed money, um, not preserve your purchasing power. <laughs> so um, it's really, you know, it was an option to go to gold, but it's not practical. It's not practically useful. It's very, very difficult to run your life if you could imagine burying gold in your backyard and having to get some out every time you wanted to go to the store. And, you know, you've obviously got the physical custody risk, et cetera. It's very, very impractical. So and now so, oh, I was going to say, so now Bitcoin comes in, right? 2009. Yes. So what we've seen since 1971 is an explosive overgrowth of the fiat state and Bitcoin is essentially restoring that ancient monetary paradigm, right? We're just reconnecting money to work. And that is the Bitcoin mining um, side of things. It's an algorithm. It's basically a complicated puzzle that a bunch of people uh, allocate energy into the network to attempt to solve. That energy is also used to secure the network. So Bitcoin is a, is a form of money that becomes more secure the more purchasing power it holds, which is pretty interesting. It's like an adaptive uh, network. It also adapts to how hard we're mining it. This is the difficulty adjustment. And so by restoring money's rootedness to physical power, it uh, devitalizes the, the overgrowth of political institutions we've seen in the wake of 1971. Do you see Bitcoin, if it were to become a mainstream used currency, like changing the way that power is allocated in society generally? Like, are there certain players that you think would win and certain that you think would lose as a result is that kind of shift? Or how do you see that evolution happening? Yes. Um, to say it in a cliche way, it's power to the people. <laughs> um, if you look at humanity as a collective organism, right, just not saying that we are, but just hypothetically, government is effectively a parasite on that process, right? The market process is what's producing all the wealth in the world. So this is humans that have wants, we want, we have desires, we want satisfied, and humans that are capable of satisfying those desires. They meet in the marketplace, right? Uh, buyers want to buy low, sellers want to sell mm -hmm. high. They, they, they form a consensus called the market price on any particular good or service. And then the market clears those wants or it satisfies those wants over time. It's only through this process of mutually consensual exchange that anything actually gets done. Now, you might argue, well, wait, what, what a minute, wait a minute. The government has all these spending programs and you know, they have huge militaries. Like, what do you mean? That's obviously they're doing something. The question is, where are they getting those funds? Where do those funds actually come from? And government is the one human organization on earth, legal human organization, that derives its revenues from non-consensual exchange, meaning that you don't have any say-so in the matter with your tax bill, the printing of money, even the outright confiscation of things like real estate through uh, programs like eminent domain in the United States. If the government wants to build a pipeline and your land's in the way, they come in and buy it. You, you don't have the right to say no, you can't negotiate. It's just, um, it's a done deal, basically. Again, at the tip of the proverbial gun. So what we have, and, and this is not uncommon in biological reality, you know, like typically evolution progresses through, through um, opponent processing. So you typically have like predator and prey in an environment and they reach some form of dynamic equilibrium, right? Where the predators want to eat the prey, but they can't eat too many or there'll be a, a population collapse. The prey want to eat the grass and survive against the predator. Um, and what fiat currency has effectively done has increased the attack surface of the market 
by the government. So the government can extract much more wealth from consensual market actors than it otherwise could because it's able to, if you consider every organization is accountable to its profit and loss statement, meaning that if I assume this is some kind of a business, this, you know, media or you have a job, whatever it is, we all have something we're doing, right? Economically, we have to have more economic inflows or outflows. Otherwise we die in this, or we lose um, our financial integrity in the same way an organism will die if it expends more calories than it consumes, right? You, there has to be a, um, a net surplus for anything to grow or survive. The government is a bit of an exception because it can produce losses and print new money to paper over those losses and externalize the cost of those losses onto society via inflation. That's the most common or a most common method. But it can also just change tax rates and tax laws arbitrarily and confiscate wealth from, from market actors. There's no, Again, there's no say from, from market actors. You can't negotiate it. You can't refuse it. Um, and some people want to say, when I get on this topic of taxation and inflation or theft, they say, well, if you don't like it, you should leave the country. Okay. If you have more than a $2 million net worth in the United States, there's a thing called the exit tax. So if you want to leave the United States, you need to pay them to leave. How is that a consensual exchange? It's like someone breaking into your house, putting a gun to your head, saying, give me you know, $5 million or I'll leave and I'll leave. And if you don't, then I'm going to shoot you. It just there's no, there's no right to say no to it. Um, so how does Bitcoin change this relationship is that it reduces the attack surface of the state on the market process and market actors. So you could think of it as removing systemic theft from an otherwise consensual market process of wealth creation. And when you remove the uncertainty of theft, or actually, I shouldn't say uncertainty. I don't want to say this. It's one thing if you just have to deal with the occasional burglar, right? You can get insurance, you can get locks on your doors, you can get a gun, you can have all these security features to reduce your attack surface to burglars. It's another thing entirely if that theft is institutionalized and made recurrent. Mm -hmm. You cannot get any insurance against tax liabilities or tax changes. You cannot get insurance, again, prior to Bitcoin uh, against hyperinflation of the US dollar. You can't protect yourself from the predations of, of institutionalized grift. And so to that end, I would say one of the easiest definitions I give for Bitcoin is that it is just an insurance policy um, on central banking or on fiat currency. So the more dollars they print, the more valuable it becomes. And it's really this somewhat simple dynamic, if you understand money, that people will always consensually choose to hold the money that's most resistant to counterfeiting. That's what gold was. And I would assert that's what Bitcoin is now becoming. That is perfect. I think leaving it right there is a perfect place to move to our questions. We had a bunch of people popping off in okay. the middle of that. So I'm going to pass on to Peter and see how our audience has been reacting to what you said. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was a good uh, good intro. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of delicious questions. So if you have any questions for Robert, pop them in the chat. Um, and I'm not going to uh, choose them in the order that they're arriving, but we'll start with Chris. Chris, you had a question. Hey. What's up, Robert? Um, not sure if you remember me. We talked at BTC Miami after your speech. I told you about um, John Verbeke's lecture series, uh, Awakening oh. from the Meaning. Consist. Well, thank you, because I've been taking a slow two-mile walk every morning and listening to one hour of that. I'm on awesome. like episode 41 right now, so I'm almost done. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was really pleased to see that you um, subsequently had him on your show. Um, so I guess you're familiar with the, the meaning crisis. Um, are you aware of a thing called Game B? I'm not. Um, okay, so I might not have enough time to explain what Game B is, um, but basically it's um, this thing that came out of the Santa Fe Institute, people like Jordan, Jordan Greenhall slash Jordan Hall, um, uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, Jim Rutt, um, where they talk about uh, just how 
how game A is this kind of uh, um, world and economy where uh, where violence is sort of the dominant player and the economics of violence is sort of um, the dominant feature of, of life. And I think this accords pretty well with the sovereign individual and their thesis too. Um, I have basically two questions about these, these things. Um, so, oh, so, so game A is this sort of violence-based system and game B is this sort of question mark system that isn't based mm -hmm. on violence mm -hmm. um, and is more based on sort of uh, collective consciousness and collaboration rather than violence. Um, and so, yeah, basically I just had two questions. Um, one is, uh, do you think that the sort of the bullshitization of money that you, um, that you referred to earlier, do you think that that has contributed to the meaning crisis and if so, how? And then my second question would be, and you don't have to answer this since you, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, ha you haven't researched game B, so I would, you probably should know more about it before answering. But I was going to ask, uh, do you think that Bitcoin is game B or could bring game B into existence? That's a great question. Um, I haven't heard of game B, but I think that synopsis you gave me gives me a good handle on it. Um, on question one, how... Uh, and let me re re recite it back and make sure I've got it correctly. Has how can Bitcoin help us solve the meaning crisis or or deal with the mass psychosis we're seeing in the world? Was that the question? Yes, I mean, so the question was how does fiat cause the meaning crisis? Okay, but I guess the illusion would be how does Bitcoin solve the meaning crisis? Sure. Yeah. So now the meaning crisis itself, I that's a very staggering um, body of work for Vakey's put together and anything that I say, I don't want to diminish or take away from that. Um, and we, I've had him on the show for a series for two series, actually one under his name and one under the one under the platonic philosophy series. So for a deeper dive on this, I would direct you that direction. I also had Matthias Desmond on the show. Uh, he wrote a book called the psychology of totalitarianism and he's, He's really carrying the torch on the thinking surrounding mass formation psychosis. And, you know, there's a number of contributory factors, but one that I think is really important is just the violation of private property. Um, and the, the, the example I use is this. First, to define property, as I often do in my show, it's not the thing. It's not the asset. It's not the table or the chair or the car or the stock of the company. It's the relationship between the owner and the asset. So the stock certificate you have certifies uh, your ownership of a certain slice of company capital or the deed you have on your house or the title you have on your car. These are all documents certifying the relationship, meaning you have control over that asset. That's what property is, the relationship, not the thing. Property is essentially the rule set we are playing by in the marketplace, right? It's you own yourself and you own the things you go out into the world and justly acquire. So this would be um, portions of nature that are not being used, right? You plant a garden or you mine some metal and then you start to sell that into the market process. That's something that's justly acquired. Um, now, if you violate property, that's I, I capture that process of adding value to things through consensual exchange with oneself, with nature and with others, I, I juxtapose that making against taking, which is theft, right? So you can also steal someone's garden, you can steal their car, all these things. You can print money, this is a viol or print currency rather, that's a violation of private property. And if property is basically the rule set we're abiding by, that you own yourself and you own the things you justly acquire in the world, if we start violating that rule set, we're now playing a game where the rules are uncertain. And if you frame this, I often frame it with poker, right? If you sit down, it's, it's the stability of rules that are the bedrock of peaceful play. If you sit down to play a game of poker and the hand rankings change every few hands, or the order of the cards are dealt randomly changes. Like there's no, there's no uh, fixed rule structure on which to build a strategy and play the game productively. So what does it, what does it do? It drives people crazy. So I think the violation of private property rights 
directly contributes to psychological instability at both the individual and collective scale. Uh, and I would say one of the most reliable ways to induce mass psychosis in a society is just hyperinflate the currency. Look what people do when currency hyperinflates. Like you can't, you can only deal with people in your very tiniest circle of trust. You can't go to the baker and buy bread. You can't buy gas. You can't do anything. So if, if the medium, right, if the property medium by which we engage with most of the world breaks down, that we can't engage in the game called the market process that we uh, increase the production of wealth and satisfaction of human wants. So I think the violation of property and the rate at which property is violated contributes to the onset of mass psychosis and possibly is a, a contributor to the meaning crisis as well. Um, now, in terms of game B, I would say that, you know, understanding the, the economics of violence is very important because I think that's what kind of rules the world. And I don't know that game B, I don't know we'd ever get away from the economics of violence. Uh, but what we can do is create systems that make violence very expensive, very risky. And that's what we've been trying to do over time too, right? Like we've, we have almost hacked ourselves into being really good at getting along with strangers through things like the rule of law. You know, there, there, there are consequences to misbehaving and that, that riskiness or costliness has been assigned to violence has led to the reduction of violence on balance over the past 5,000 years. Now, there's still this issue of physical property, right? Like physical gold can be confiscated. Um, and this led to uh, the use of something like, like banking, but banking has its own economics of violence or coercion in play that it's very easy to just steal depositor funds, um, especially if you've got the government standing behind you. So I view Bitcoin as the most expensive property relationship in human history to violate. So that means that, you know, theft, aggression, coercion, violence against a Bitcoiner to try and obtain their Bitcoin, assuming it's been custodied properly, and we get into the technical weeds a bit here, but, you know, a geographically distributed multi-sig means you can't really steal it. Like, even if you kill the guy, you're not going to get his Bitcoin. And if he's custodied it well, then it's going to roll off to his ears and you're, you know, kind of out of luck. So I, I view Bitcoin as an incentive system that dissuades us from violence because it, it lowers the profitability of violence or coercion. And so I don't know that we ever escape violence. Like so long as we are animals, we're going to have this, you know, kind of Darwinian underpinning in our existence that, that can lead us to be, you know, animalistic or violent in some way. But the human side of us can design systems that make the profitability of such activities lower and lower and lower. And that is the equivalent, I think, of pushing us towards higher civility. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Robert, uh, do you have a hard stop at the top or could you go 15, 20 minutes over? Uh, let me just check real quick. We have a bunch of awesome questions and I'd like to get to a few of them. Yeah, I can go for about an extra 10 or 15. Cool. All right, uh, Jared, would you like to ask one of your questions? If you're there. Yeah, yeah hey, sure. Um, so I, uh, a huge fan, by the way, um, your Thank podcast you. is incredible. Um, <clears throat> I, there's two questions that I think are pretty sound. Um, can you speak more to the necessity of the energy usage of Bitcoin for people who are struggling with the climate, chi climate change side of things? Hmm. Why is the energy usage necessary for sound money? Hmm. Um, I've heard this answer before on your podcast, but I think it'd be really helpful for um, people in general to kind of to know that. Um, and then the second question, which is a little trickier, um, how do you view the need for wisdom in the allocation of energy? Is a perfected market in Bitcoin wise? And uh, what about the awareness of the substrate that we live on? So uh, those kind of go second together. hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First one, I think might be a strong one to be able to answer. The second one, feel free to. Uh, I'll, I'll do I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Sure. Um, 
Okay, so on energy usage, first of all, as we we somewhat covered this in the first half that, okay, how do I say this? If you want to create a money or currency that nobody can counterfeit, then the only way to do that would be to peg it to the thing in the universe that nobody knows how to counterfeit. And that is energy, right? Um, energy cannot be neither be created nor destroyed. So as was true with gold, that the requirement of energy necessary to produce it secured the integrity of its supply against arbitrary inflation, debasement, or counterfeiting, the same is true of Bitcoin. Um, however, Bitcoin is a bit of a step function better than gold in that we have, for the first time in human history, an asset with a perfectly fixed supply. Now, many people, especially in crypto, will say, well, that doesn't mean anything because, you know, shitcoin A over here has a thousand total supply and it's locked forever and it's decentralized and the team told me so and they wrote a fancy white paper and they have six famous advisors on their board and they raised $50 million of institutional capital. And there's only a thousand of these shitcoin tokens that will ever exist. What you fail to understand is that that asset is under the control of someone or some organization that, that they've effectively rendered you a promise and said, I promise you, I will never print any more um, of these shit coins over here. That does not, there's not a lot of credibility to that promise, right? You're, you're, you're trusting someone, you have counterparty risk. You have to have faith in an individual or faith in a human nature uh, not to follow their own incentives and increase the supply of this currency to their own benefit at the expense of everyone else in the same way the central bank does and has always done. So I would say the only known way in reality to give us a high assurance the highest assurance possible that a money will not be counterfeited or debased is to require the expenditure of energy in its production. It's what makes it honest, right? This is, and proof of work, and I mentioned this, true for gold, true for Bitcoin, but also true for nature, true for capitalism. Look in your life. Like, does anything ever happen of value that you didn't have to work for? Like, there has to be an expenditure of energy to create things of value. This is the nature of um, the reality we inhabit. And so in terms of the how that fits into the climate change debate, I, you've got to disentangle this real quick. Energy usage is not pollution, right? These are two different things. The amount, again, the Kardashev scale I mentioned earlier, we want a civilization that harnesses more energy. That means it's a civilization that satisfies more human wants. It has more carrying capacity. Um, what we really want in a civilization to prevent pollution is strong property rights. If you dump pollution in my river and I have a strong property right in that river, then I have recourse to some legal or political apparatus that can sue you, right? And I can force you to impute the cost of that dumping into your business model. So all of a sudden we can, we can reduce the profitability of dumping that pollution into my river for uh, the polluter, let's say. And again, back to incentives, that's how we would fix ecological crisis. It's stronger property rights, not lowering energy usage. That is, it is ass backwards, frankly. If you want to lower energy usage, why don't we just go back to the Stone Age, right? We're using the least amount of energy ever then. And we're also living hand to mouth, totally uncivilized, no literacy, you know, no forward thinking. That's achievable, but it's antithetical to civilization itself. So you have to get higher resolution with your thinking um, energy usage is not pollution. These are two separate things. Again, pollution being a violation of property, energy usage being um, humans making the natural world, um, humans harnessing the natural world in a way that helps leverage the accomplishment of their aims, right? These are two different things entirely. Okay, wisdom. Uh, <laughs> This is a real deep question. So wisdom is a huge topic too. And I'm just going to pick one slice of it, uh, inspired largely by Mr. Verveke, that it's something that helps us resist systemic self-deception, right? That helps us identify when we are 
making errors or deceiving ourselves uh, and overcome that, that systemic self-deception. Now, when I study the history of humanity, uh, admittedly somewhat narrowly, right? I'm looking through the lens of economics and money largely. So I might just, this might be a bias of my own that I'm just looking at one particular topic too much. But what I see is we've made gains in, in a lot of domains, but we still seem to be somewhat in like the economic dark ages to some extent. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Before the marginalism revolution, which is in the mid 1800s, human beings thought value was an actual particle in the world, right? That a table had a certain number of utils is what they called this particle inside of it. And maybe a car had a different number of utils inside of it. Maybe the table has a hundred and the car has a thousand. And the number of utils constituting these assets determined their exchange ratio and pricing on the market. That's what we thought. That was, that was science until the mid 1800s before someone said the very obvious thing, like, what are you talking about? This is all based on preference, right? I can buy and sell something for whatever I want. It's just a matter of, or I can put something up for offer on the market to, to sell or to buy rather. And I can put something up to sell on the market for whatever I want, but the market will only clear where these subjective determinations meet, right? Where two consensual market actors agree to buy and sell something at a certain price. So this has nothing to do with an objective reality. This is purely subjective. This is two subjects coming together and agreeing to exchange something at a certain rate. So the revolution was, hey, all value is subjective and it's all, we value everything at the margin. Meaning that your first bottle of water is more valuable to you than your 100th bottle of water, for instance, because you're a human and you can only consume so much water. So we're a bit in the economic dark ages. And when I look at monetary history, there's this recurrent pattern of economic hardship, you know, or recession sets in. People convince themselves that, hey, let's print just a little bit of money to like really stimulate demand, get things going. Um, everyone's being very tight right now. Things are tight. No one's, uh, people are hold, hoarding wealth is, you know, common term which is the same thing as saving, by the way, like where do you draw the line between saving and hoarding? It's a value judgment. Let's print just a little bit of money to grease the wheels and get the economy moving again. Okay, well, they do that. This leads to a number of things we talk about on the show, price signal distortion, misallocation of capital. Uh, it actually contributes to future recession because when you line up a bunch of these projects that um, are improperly priced and they fail all at once, it, it makes the next recession worse. So you, once you start printing money, you engage in this process of kind of like an addictive behavior where the next time you'll need to print just a little more money to have the same effect. And each quantity of money produced in this way has a diminishing effect on actual economic activity. And so this, and then, you know, it spirals and spirals and spirals and then currency hyperinflates. There's a total devastation of the economy. You know, when you break the monetary protocol, typically the political protocols on top of that breakdown, and then you'll get these guys, you know, that live through this and they'll say, hey, all right, we learned from this. That was a really bad idea. We should never print money again. Um, in Britain, what is the name of this act? I want to say, this is discussed in my Twilight of Gold series. I think it was called the the List Act, I can't recall. 16 or 1700s in Britain, they agreed to have a fixed money supply. There would only ever be 15,000 pounds ever issued. We're never going to issue another pound ever again. This is our fixed money supply. This is our proto-Bitcoin, basically. And then what happens? Like 30 years later, right? There's some economic calamity. And they're like, ah, you know, I know we said we'd never print any more money, but let's just print a little more just to get through this one time. And then we'll never do it again. And then, you know, they start debasing, debasing, debasing. The pound has been around for 320 years, roughly. And it's lost 99.5% of its value in that time. And it's one of the best performing fiat currencies of all time, just to give you an idea of how bad it is. So 
if wisdom is the capacity to resist or at least identify systematic self-deception and overcome it, and I see humanity that's been engaged in this recurrent self-deception that printing money can solve real problems in the real economy or increase the satisfaction of human wants, I would say that maybe Bitcoin does contribute to some kind of socioeconomic wisdom. It's like, it's the Ulysses contract, if you've ever heard of this term, but Ulysses had to lash himself to the mast so that future Ulysses, when he's out on the sea and he heard the, the irresistible song of the sirens singing to him, he would not, you know, jump into the water and die, I, I think, being bashed against the rocks. Present him had to make an agreement with himself that bound future him for making a bad decision. I think Bitcoin's like the ultimate Ulysses contract for humanity that we've now lashed ourselves to the mass of we can't print money anymore. And therefore it, it um, enhances the, the, the longevity and vitality of our future selves by not engaging in this, this, this psychotic behavior, frankly. Like, and it's so psychotic. We have an entire pseudoscience called Keynesian economics that is provably a pseudoscience, completely debunked in basically every regard, you know. And it, it, it underpins the modern economic system, and it's nothing more than a pseudoscience that justifies the monopolization and printing of money. Like this, the, 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 hmm, the power of money over man's mind is so strong that we will literally rationalize anything to keep doing it. And I would say Keynesian economics is one of the highest expressions of that. And the promise of Bitcoin, obviously we're not there yet, is that it will prevent us from engaging in that recurrent pattern of self-deception any longer. Any uh, follow-up share by Jared? That was great. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Ariel, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Um... I wanted to get into inflation a little bit more. Uh, you mentioned how um, inflation can create can't create wealth; it can only move wealth from one part of the economy to another. Um, but one movement which inflation does seem to uh, lead to is the movement of money, uh, the movement of wealth away from the short-term interests of the market towards uh, longer-term investments, often funded by government. Um, mm. So, an example would be research into the properties of light which is not going to be profitable for a very long time, but could lead to really good quantum computers in like 100 years. So I'm wondering, in your view, um, would a Bitcoin-based economy, how does it account for these um, kind of longer-term investments, which are not going to be profitable for a long time? That's a great question. Um, there is an argument, and there are many arguments made, that the capacity of a government to run at a deficit is a net positive for society that they don't need to be accountable to their P&L so that they can do things like this where, you know, they will steal funds through taxation and inflation and invest it in this thing that has been deemed societally important uh, despite no market actor, you know, willingly contributing to a cause like that. Now, maybe there is some truth to this to some extent, but I would have significant reservations about how the, the deeming process goes, goes down, right? Like who is it that's deeming that this particular use of funds is societally relevant um, in a way that people engaging in consensual action did not? So I would, I would take a lot of issues with that. But even more importantly, I think that when you have an economic system with taxation and inflation integrated into it, you are drastically inhibiting aggregate wealth creation. So if GDP, global GDP now is, let's say it's a hundred, no, what, what's global, what is the global GDP? A hundred trillion, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, I would say if you could completely remove the, un, the certain uninsurable theft integrated into that system that you could unrestrain wealth creation significantly. So these projects of long-term capital allocation, I think you said studying the properties of light, for instance, which don't have any immediate 
payoff, right? Maybe there's no immediately commercializable uh, usage to studying the properties of light, for instance. But when you look at, you know, if we look backwards through history, there's a lot of those types of projects that had no immediately obvious payoff that became extremely important later on. Um, one that comes to mind is like, not that this was a long-term project, but imaginary numbers, right? We didn't know that they seemed kind of silly for a long time, but then all of a sudden we get into the, the age of wireless technologies and imaginary numbers are very important. So I would say that the more wealth we can accumulate, the more we're actually lowering the time preference of individual actors, uh, which is the same thing as saying increasing the time horizon, right? The more wealth you have, the, mo the more you can reliably plan into the future. And that would increase the horizon for long-term capital allocation. So I don't think, you know, that argument has been used that you need taxation and inflation by some arbitrary authority. And then that arbitrary authority somehow decide, decides which enterprises are societal, societally valuable to do them. But I don't buy that whole argument. I think people, I don't think there's anything that can be accomplished through non-consensual exchange that cannot be accomplished better through purely consensual exchange. And there's an argument here. The Austrian argument is this. It's based on the inequality of exchange. So we would say, if you and I want to do a deal, you have apples, I have oranges, whatever it is. Let's keep it simple. One apple, one orange. Intuition would tell us that when we execute that trade, we trade apple for orange, that one apple equals one orange in the marketplace. And that's true from an outsider's perspective. They saw one apple, one orange traded between two consensual parties. We both had the right to say no at any time, but we agreed to do the trade. So that would mean those things are equal. But if we look at that trade from our perspective, you and I would not trade if we both thought one apple equals one orange because we'd be no better off, right? It would not improve my position. It would not uh, reduce my felt uneasiness, as Mises would say, nor would it for you because it's you'd be giving the exact amount of value that you're receiving. So what actually happens is that willing consensual participants to a trade, trade at exactly the point, you know, in our case, where I value the orange you're giving me above the apple that I'm giving up and you do the reverse. So it's, and it's through that process, again, if all value is subjective and psychological, it's only through consensual trade that we can increase net value creation. So we've increased the total satisfaction of human wants based on the consensual nature of that exchange. If we take away the consensual aspect and it's, you know, there's a threat or there's some, some other type of theft occurring, one party to that trade is going to be, they're not going to have that gain in value, that psychological profit or the increase in subjective value. So it's going to be on net less value per, less value generative than consensual exchange. So the big argument here is you're, you're trying to justify, not you, but the argument that inflation or taxation is necessary for long-term capital allocation is an attempt to justify non-consensual exchange on the terms that it will benefit future humanity in some nebulous way that we figured out that other people couldn't figure out. And I just don't buy it. I don't buy the argument at all. I think if you take non-consensual exchange out of the equation, to the extent you take a non-consensual exchange out of the equation, you increase total wealth creation. And total wealth creation is what underpins long-term thinking, right? The more secure you are in your present circumstances, the further out into the future you can think, uh, the longer you can endure periods of illiquidity, right? You can make investments in capital that might not mature for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and all of that's based on, on total wealth creation. So I would side much more strongly, I think, with the traditional libertarian, philosophical, or Austrian economic argument that the real aim is to increase total wealth creation. And that's done through exclusively through consensual exchange. Anywhere there's non-consensual exchange, it's net value destructive. Any follow-up, uh, Sharon, Ariel?
Um, so maybe we'll do one more question. There's a, a Juan Galt in the room, so I have to tag him in for his question. Uh, Juan, would you like to uh, ask your question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Great. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's there's a couple of questions that I think are related here about the economics of violence. Um, one of them is, I mean, I'll just I'll just I'll just uh, cite the question that I just wrote as an example. Um, basically, there is a, a game theoretical scenario where a neighboring nation uh, can benefit from inflating their own currency in order to invest their own, in their own military output and thus their capacity to project power in the immediate and conquer the na their neighbors. And so their neighbors are now in a bind because if they can't match that expansion of immediate power projection, then maybe they have to devalue their own currency to invest in their own military infrastructures they can counter and possibly defend against this initiative and even, ca and even capture the aggressor's sort of resources in this sort of game of war. They're both sacrificing their future economy with the bet that if they win, they can they can pay off that debt with the neighbor's resources, right? And and that's uh, kind of one of the examples where inflation becomes kind of a necessary tool for self-preservation. And then this kind of ties into the other question, which is nucle the nuclear stalemate, which is a, a an aspect of the economics of violence that wasn't really addressed in in um, in the in the book. Oh gosh, what's the book? talking about earlier um the sovereign individual um and so I, I guess i just want your thoughts on that aspect of game theory and you know maybe i know bitcoin there's a way that bitcoin can play into that but um yeah just i just wanted your thoughts on that yeah okay so the first point and we've i would check out again the twilight of gold series we talked a lot about this um and the way that my guest put it somewhat succinctly, but I think makes a lot of sense is the existence of an option like fiat currency in which you can debase, the, the issuing authority can debase its currency to extract resources from its population to wage war. Uh, the, that incentive schema effectively makes you as crazy as your craziest neighbor, right? Because the game theoretic structure there is, well, Germany's debasing their currency and they've raised an army and, you know, put together military equipment that is five times larger than ours. If we're going to do that and keep pace with them, we need to debase our currency as well. Right. So you get into this loop of they debased, they're a threat to us. We need to debase to, to stand up against them. And so that's a reality. And that's, that is the reality of world war one and world war two, really that the first time the whole world's on a gold standard. We're all under one kind of monetary paradigm. But once um, a an aggressive power starts to debase the currency that other powers that are threatened have to engage in similar behavior as a means of, of protection. Um, there's there's a there's a darker twist here too that you know the history of central banking and the history of war are very deeply intertwined. So a lot of these banks will typically lend to both sides and therefore whoever loses or whoever wins, whoever loses the bank wins. Um, I would say that that's a pretty, pretty dark side of, of uh, fiat as well. But if I rerun that scenario where something like Bitcoin exists, um, I think that, and we have to think about these, it's very tempting to think about these incentives at the scale of economic aggregates like nation states and central banks. I mean, we have to, right? We have to use these useful fictions to, to construct our mental models. But the ultimate touch points of the Bitcoin incentive system are at the individual level, right? This is about individual incentives playing out into uh, these aggregates. And so I think as the amount of uncertainty increases in the world, and this could be Taxation, government oppression, inflation, warfare, um, just general entropy in our socioeconomic reality, the more you're creating what I like to call an osmotic pressure of people, individuals that are seeking to preserve 
their purchasing power, which is their economic vitality, just like they're trying to preserve their physical vitality, right? They're going to leave war zones. They're going to uh, relocate. They're going to secure their home. You know, maybe they'll have guns, whatnot. You're creating this osmotic pressure for individuals to adopt and hold their savings and purchasing power in assets that are immune to that uncertainty or that are maximally resistant to that uncertainty. And this is historically, you know, if you get into Nick Zabo's work, that's how he defines money, actually. He says money is the trust minimized asset, meaning that it's the one asset you can hold that you minimally need to trust anyone else. You don't need to worry about people's changing opinions or actions, um, violating the relationship you have as an owner with your asset. And so something like gold was relatively the most trust minimized asset we had historically, because you could store a lot of economic value in a small space. There's a lot of density. You could put it in a you know physically secure location, like a vault. Um, it's somewhat limited in its portability, which is something obviously Bitcoin solves for. And then it was accepted worldwide, right? And so if you're going to, if we're going into wartime uh, and you, you see this a lot, that individuals start to hoard gold, right? They start to, when, um, I can't remember who brought this up. When there's a certain Jewish family escaping Germany as uh, during the rise of Nazism, he liquidated a lot of his businesses and assets. And he saw that, you know, as people were leaving Germany, Initially, they were charging them an exit tax as well. And the exit tax became very oppressive. It was like north of 50%, 60, 70, 80, 90. And so he had his wife fashion, they liquidated his assets, bought precious metals, I think mostly gold, fashioned them into coat hangers. And so like hung all of her and his wardrobe on these hangers and then left the country with that. That was their means of, of fleeing, right? Of, of escaping an uncertain situation with maximal certainty. So he used these hangers as, as a trust minimized asset. And so that's where Bitcoin really shines because ultimately it's just an open source software solution, right? There, there, you literally can't even hide anything in Bitcoin. It's open source. There's nowhere to hide anything. It's 100% um, it's verification and 0% trust. So now, you know, that may be somewhat of an oversimplification because you are trusting the self-interestedness of the mining network, for instance, right? You're trusting that they'll behave according with their own self-interest. Um, but if, if there's any good bet to make in the world, I think it's that one, right? People are going to follow, individuals will follow what's in their own self-interest more or less. So I think in the event now of a country rising to power, rapidly debasing its currency to mobilize a large military and invade another one is just going to increase that pressure worldwide. You're just going to increase the likelihood of people to move savings into something that's resistant, uh, obviously immune to debasement, but more resistant to confiscation, easier to conceal, very easy to move across a border, right? You put a Bitcoin private key on your brain, you can walk across a border with a you know a billion dollars on your brain and uh, have you know basically total plausible deniability. Um, so the entire, <laughs> and this is why we call it the Bitcoin rabbit hole because the entire pattern of human existence up until this point, the game board has radically shifted. The incentives have radically changed. The ways in which we will conceal our wealth and use trust minimized assets, um, the, the individual just has a lot more optionality in, in the wake of, of Bitcoin. So um, I think the long, the long run consequence of this is, again, we're stuck in economic aggregates. What would this nation do if that nation did this? If you look at, the, if you look at it just that way, you'll fail to see the forest for the trees, right? You have to look at the individual incentives that happen in these periods of massive upheaval. Um, and it's, it's by this mechanism or pattern or the resolution of the individual, I think that we 
ultimately see something like the sovereign individual thesis plays out play out where you know anonymous digital cyber cash as they called it would lead to the dissolution of the nation state as an organizing model and if you couple that with the the disincentivization of violence um you know i think the future is pretty bright but the the mid game between now and there is obviously rife with uncertainty All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would just, uh, 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 just a quick follow up on that. Um, the sovereign individual, as I mentioned, didn't talk about nuclear defense and the uh, the mutually assured destruction game theory, which I, like, I love the book, but like that seemed to me like a critical flaw in the analysis. And and while I tend to agree with everything that with most of the things that that were uh, I guess put forth in that book that the full dissolution of the state seems to be a kind of it seems to be limited by this this game theory because at some point you have to have some sort of structure that manages that nuclear power and in in a in a wise way right and how to manage that is not a simple question so I think there's some probably some limits to to how much a nation state can dis, can dilute in the in you know in a game where there's nuclear defense uh power but um I'll just I'll just leave you with that if you have any, any thoughts yeah, that interesting. I I hear you on that. I would say check out the series I'm doing with Jason Lowry. We talk a lot about this. He thinks he actually has labeled Bitcoin as a mutually assured preservation protocol. Um, but the the actual dynamics of who holds the keys to nuclear weapons is clearly still a big question mark. I also think it becomes increasingly uncertain as the uh as that technology becomes cheaper right that you could have even just a rogue individual detonating a nuclear weapon like that's much more concerning than a rogue nation where presumably you need um you know at least the buy-in of, of several individuals so we are in kind of a race where we have we've created these technologies like nuclear weaponry that can destroy the game right a, a play can actually break the game. We could, we could end ourselves, um, which to me is just more of an impetus to see something like Bitcoin succeed. Um, and that, you know, if the profitability of coercion and violence is lowered so much, maybe we'll just wake up from this like a bad dream. Like, what have we been doing? Pointing nuclear weapons at each other, jeopardizing our, the entire existence of our species over some present political disputes over resources. You know, it's quite insane if you think about it. Um, but the the actual evolution to that state of mind is something like a, you know, something on the spectrum of a global consciousness revolution. And I, I don't know, I don't know if that's possible or if Bitcoin contributes to that or not. Um, but hopefully, these types of conversations are at least pushing the world in that direction. Awesome. Um, so we're going to thank you. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, we're going to gently close here. Uh, Robert, any uh, parting words you'd like to leave us with uh, here today at the Stoa? No, I, you know I appreciate you guys having me. I, I'm I'm frankly thrilled that I get to do what I do. I you know wrestle with these big ideas and then to read, write, and talk about it with people and to render that value into the lives of others gives me tremendous fulfillment. Um, I'm always just ecstatic when people tell me that the work has helped them out in this way or the other. So, you know, thank you all. And, um, you know, Bitcoin needs you. Bitcoin needs everyone. This, this idea, it, it's our role in history, really. It's just to, I think, clean up the mess that we've inherited. And I don't see, I don't see that as a viable possibility without something like Bitcoin. And although we might look like a cult from the outside, at least we're the cult with the best money. So I have hope for us. Awesome. Uh, and if you want to take the Bitcoin rabbit hole, definitely check out Robert's uh, What Is Money show. And Robert, yeah, you have a, such a great talent of just bringing clarity. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll make some closing announcements uh, now for upcoming events at the Stoa. We have our first ViewQuake book club. Uh, Timothy Morton's coming in to talk about hyper objects. 
And then we have uh, next month, the collapse of complex societies, which is related to some of the stuff we talked to about today. And the dictator's handbook, why bad behavior is almost good politics. That famous rules of ruler uh, video is based off this book. And we might have the sovereign individual, uh, James, come in for, for the new year. Um, so check that out at thestoa.ca. And uh, Robert, everyone, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today. Thank you so much. Let's do it.